This is Mrs. O'Neill for AP Chemistry, Chapter 16, Section 6.1, because it's Part 1. These are the notes. So you should have watched the intro lesson on acid-base equilibrium. So our whole Chapter 15 was on equilibrium, but those are just general reactions, and those were reactions based off of uh, gases. Now, when we're talking about acid-base equilibrium, we're really talking about the solution. So we're talking about things aqueous. Here are my notes. He talked about how this Harvard University got a, a Chinese statue donated to them and they actually have to cover it up because of acid rain. They don't want to get it ruined. Gave you that nice flow chart and look at this. Our K algebraic expression is exactly the same like it was. Products divided by reactants. So we want to remember that these reactions happen in water, but we usually try to ignore that water. Okay, um, We're going to talk about water and why it's so important and sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't in the reaction. Well part of it is because water is amphoteric meaning that it can act as an acid or a base. It depends on the situation. It depends who it's reacting with. And here's an example of acetic acid in water and your conjugate acid base pair. So this should kind of make sense to you by now right here's our acid. It's going to um, donate um, a hydrogen to its base making that hydronium ion and of course you're left with your conjugate base or that acetate ion. So here's ammonium in water. Again, a lot of times ammonia in water, we will write the water because of the OH that it forms. This is one of the reasons why ammonia is a base because it does react with that acid. Again, that acid being the uh, proton donor, donating it to the ammonia, making the ammonium polyatomic ion and those hydroxide ions. And again, those hydroxide ions are giving it that pH value, making it a base. Auto ionization, again, serves both as a uh, proton donor and acceptor. So guys, really, water can react with itself. Kind of weird, but this is really what's going on. So again, why do we need to know this information? Well, because if we look at that K, in this case KW, because we're dealing with water, if we're looking at that expression, we're dealing with our products, but not our reactants. We get rid of that reactant. And why? Because water is a liquid. These guys would be aqueous, so they're included in that expression, but the water would not be. So the concentration of that hydronium and hydroxide ions can now be, um, it can be very, very helpful to know that this Kw value is 1 times 10 to the negative 14. That's going to be really helpful later on. What does this mean? Well, that our hydronium or H plus equals our ne uh, negative OH minus ions, uh, and they both equal the 1 times 10 to the negative 7, which gives us that pH of 7. So again, strong versus weak. Well, this equilibrium constant is going to help us decide how weak that acid is or how strong that acid is, um, or I should say how strength, the strength of that weak acid. So a lot of times we talk about these weak acids, but we're still talking about the strength of that weak acid, how strong or weak the weak acid is. A little confusing, but we want to remember that a strong acid goes to completion, right? There's 100% ionizes. So what happens then for a weak acid? Well, this Ka is going to be small. Why is the Ka value going to be small? Because if we notice in our equation, okay, in our algebraic equation, if we have a small number here, less than one, that means we have more of these guys on the bottom. Kind of like, think about a two over one equals two versus a one over two equals 0.5. That's less than one. That means that we have more, inf more molecules more reactants um, than we do ions, and that's what makes it weak. That's how we know that we have something weak and it doesn't associate 100%. So again, a strong acid, however, would be a very, very large K because you'd have mostly ions and very, very little, if any, um, molecules, right? Because they dissociate 100%. And again, do, 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 down here, we have those list of strong acids. So we might want to remember that list again. Polyprotic just means that more than one is taken away. Um, so if we look here, H2SO4, that means there'll be two reactions. One reaction with one H taken away, um, leaving us with HSO4 negative, and then that guy will also dissociate um, to take away the second H, and we're left with SO4 negative 2. So here's some general equations that he went over. Again, um, 
weak acid is usually donated or, 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 or shown as HA, um, and our weak bases are usually just regular old B. But here's some general equations that you're going to see in the future. So we not only have the Ka for, for weak acids, we also have the Kb for weak bases. But we can compare the two. And again, down here, he gives you a list of strong, strong bases. Again, think about that list. So neutralization reactions, I'm going to tell you right now that this was a nice preview of what you're going to learn in chapter 17. In 17, we're going to be learning about these titration curves in a great, great detail and learning that there's two groups or three, or I'm sorry, three, three groups or three scenarios, strong and strong together. That's actually pretty simple. However, when you get to weak acid, strong base or strong acid, weak base, then things change a little bit and your titration curve is going to be a little bit more complex. So he went into talking about that, right? He talked about acid-base titrations and how if you have strong, strong, your equivalence point equals equilibrium, which should make sense because your H plus equals your OH minus. That's why you have water and a pH of seven. So you do not get a curve like this when you're dealing with things that are weak and strong mixed together. It looks more like this. And why does it look like this? Uh-oh, that guy again. Let me see if I can get his name. Le Chatelier's principle. Hope I said that right. Um, he's going to talk about, or he did talk about, and we're going to learn more about how this area is called the buffer. We have a different equivalence point. It's either going to be higher or lower than that seven. And then, of course, we have the end point where everything is gone. But why did he talk about his principle? Well, again, that buffer resists the change in pH. That buffer is going to keep establishing or resist that change um, because of that shift in the equilibrium. At some point though we do, we shift it too far and it does go the other way. So again we can also look at the opposite graph where we're dealing with a strong um, acid, I'm sorry, a, a weak base. We're starting with a weak base here but we're titrating it with a strong acid and we get basically the same type of curve, it's just opposite. So in your packet of notes, your objective will be to learn the ionization of weak acid in water is an equilibrium process, and this Ka value is going to help us calculate the pH of that acid solution. So what's the difference between strong and weak? Hopefully you can see the difference. This guy is very, very strong. Well, why? I don't know about you, but I do not see any HCl molecules in here. They are all ions. However, when we look at this beaker, he's weak. Why is he weak? Well, I do see some ions, H plus, NO2 negative. I do see some ions, but look here. I also see a molecule of HNO2. And if you haven't noticed, one, two, three, four. Again, I'm always talking about counting those, those particles. Four of the molecules as a whole and only one um, of each of the ions that broke apart. So we know that this is weak and going to have a very small Ka value. So things to remember on your test and on the exam, no matter what the question is, you see an acid and a base, you label it strong or weak. The other thing you might want to do is write out the balanced equation. So not only do you want the equation, you want it nice and balanced because again, stoichiometry is your friend in AP chemistry. So pause the video, uh, fill in the words, and then play to hear my voice. So what makes a, an acid weak? Well, it doesn't associate 100%, which means you have that small Ka value. Now, this is the reaction that you're no, most likely going to see. However, sometimes you do see the water in there. Don't let that confuse you. The only difference here is if they include water in the reaction, that means you have the hydronium ion that's being formed and not the H plus ion. Also, notice this arrow. A lot of times, instead of seeing in, how do I want to say this, an equal amount of arrow, you kind of see a little difference in arrow here. You have a small arrow on the top, but a really large arrow on the bottom. Well, why is that? Well, again, because you have, it's, it's not going this way. The reverse reaction is actually more prominent, right? The reverse reaction is more in favor, meaning it's weak because you have more of this enthoic acid um, than you have its um, polyatomic ion. So we want to remember that reaction is going to be equilibrium and that Ka value should be less than one because we have more reactants, ooh, that number on the bottom is more than the number on the top.
So what am I talking about? Numbers on the top and number on the bottom. Well, again, RKA. Now remember, these are all aqueous, so they can be part of this concentration. Anything aqueous and anything gas. Liquids and solids are not part of any K expression. Um, so again, most acids are weak, okay? There's very little strong acids. Those are the ones that are on your list. There were like seven or eight of them, right? And also bases, same thing. So we want to remember that that higher the Ka value, the stronger the acid. So even if it's a weak acid, we can still talk about the strength of one weak acid compared to another weak acid. So in the next few slides, I'm going to kind of bring to your attention a titration curve. I would like you to go through the slides first, kind of look at them, read them, try to understand them, um, and then do a quick sketch in your notes. And like I said, don't go crazy at this point, but in Chapter 17, we will be dealing with these titration curves over and over and over again. So here is the titration curve, okay? So in this case, we have a weak acid okay acetic acid is weak so we're starting out with a weak acid and we're adding NaOH to it which is a very strong base I will tell you that titration curves again just like he talked about the three groups it's either going to be strong strong or you have a mixture of something strong and weak you will never see a weak weak titration curve so just to kind of bring that to your attention so there's this halfway equivalence point that's where that Ka is um, and that's what we want to uh, talk about that's where that equilibrium is with the um, weak acid. Then there's this equivalence point, and then of course, after we add so much N, uh, NaOH, that strong base, eventually we're going to push that equilibrium so far that all we're going to have left is the strong NaOH in our solution. So again, I started that here because that's really where the Ka um, halfway equivalence point. So here's our equivalence point. Halfway between where we started would be um, right in the middle of our buffer area. That would give us our Ka. So again, what does this mean? Again, when we talk about the actual equivalence point, that's where all of the acid is converted to all the conjugate base, okay? It's kind of converted all the way, okay? So equal uh, equivalence point, um, at least for weak strong, doesn't necessarily mean equal, okay? But here, this, this point of where our Ka is, um, this is where our equilibrium is really established, right? In the beginning, it's just so weak, so weak, so weak, um, and here is where it is really established. So again, pause the video, kind of read this over, make sure that it makes sense. And again, we will be really concentrating this uh, next chapter. This as well, uh, make sure you're understanding what's going on with this titration curve and the parts of it. And I believe you can write whatever you want on this graph. I gave you pretty much space in your notes for it. Read that over as well. That's where it's talking about that half equivalence point, and that's where that Ka value is. And of course, this information. So we want to remember again that halfway equivalence point and what's going on with our Ka value. So, oh, before you even look at this, because this is an example of all three, I would go back to those graphs. I would go back to the video, make sure you draw that graph and label the parts and write anything else that you want on that um, just to get you started on what these titrations are. So why did I give you this? Well, these are... Um, again, three different weak acids, three different Ka values, right? Because again, they're constant, but they're constant per, um, per acid, right? Every acid has its own Ka value. Uh, and again, this shows you that how the curve would look differently per um, each weak acid. Um, however, at the same point right here, when, when it kind of shoots up, that will be where our equivalence point is. That's where the H plus and OH minus are equal. Because we're dealing with a weak acid, though, it is not at 7, right? Equivalence point only equals 7 when we're dealing with strong, strong. When we're dealing with weak, strong, it's going to either be below 7 or above 7, depending on what you're starting with and what you're adding. But this is where our Ka value is, and that's going to be that halfway point. That's where there's that true established equilibrium is. Okay, we'll see you in class.